from the previous last Tuesday's talk on echocardiographic assessment of valve morphology and function. So, like I said last time, we need it to be very interactive so we can benefit maximally. We'll start off by a quiz. The purpose is to revise what we did last time. So here I have uh, blanked out the labeling of this mitral valve. It's an on pass view of the mitral valve. So can somebody tell me um, what the various segments are, the names? Can somebody type that out? We have an anterior leaflet, we have a posterior leaflet. The posterior leaflet has these indrawings, the commissures giving rise to scallops. Okay, so they are, there are these three portions then of the posterior leaflet, very well defined. The anterior leaflet does not have these normally, but if these are named P1 to P3, the corresponding facing anterior leaflet portions become named A1 to A3. Now remember that A1 is where the left atrial appendage will be. So that will be the leftmost part. In a parasternal short axis view, the left part will be that on the left side of the screen. So A1, A2, A3 and P1, P2, P3. This is how labeling is done. And when we have to communicate with the surgeon about which part of, a, of the valve is pathologic, it makes sense to describe in terms of these segments. So, for example, in mitral valve prolapse, the most common form of regurgitation is along both A2 is the problem and you have jets on either side. So, the surgeon knows exactly what we are talking about. Similarly, let's say there's a perforation that you identify in one particular corner of the leaflet. You can tell the surgeon, so this is where, you know, it appears to be in A3 or P3 or whatever the case may be. TE is a very good medium for interrogating the mitral valve. There are a whole host of articles on TE evaluation of the mitral valve, various planes, and how nicely we can see all the segments. So for question two, we're going to observe what is being done in the next two slides and we're going to figure out why we are doing it. And this can also go down. So I hope everybody can see what I'm seeing. We've got a freeze frame of the four chamber um, view of the heart and we have a tracing going around what looks like a regurgitant jet, blue in color, tracing and giving an area of 5 centimeter square. And we have the next picture tracing out the outline of the left atrium and giving an area of uh, 15. So can uh, anyone tell me why we would be doing it? Do I see the chat box here? That's the chat box, okay. So, what we are doing over here is looking at the area of the regurgitant jet with respect to the left atrium. I like this more than absolutely looking at the uh, uh, just the jet area because uh, in a small child, a smaller, yeah, so somebody says to assess the severity of MR, which is correct. So the point, the whole idea of taking a ratio is to remove that absolute number thing, which you know pre prevents us from um, you, you know how easy it is for adults. They remember one value for a particular thing. So cut off is let's say 130 milliseconds for something, or in this in this case, let's say the if the jet area is more than um, 10 centimeters square, it's significant for us. It's not not that easy. In a neonate, if you have a jet area of five, it might be significant. So instead of you know getting into absolute numbers, we look at the maximum jet that we can produce in a four chamber view and compare it to the left atrial area. So that's how we figure out the severity, quantify the severity of the mitral regurgitation. Important thing is to be true to yourself. Important thing is to maximize 
uh, the, take the view where you have the maximum mitral regurgitant jet and the LE area. So look at this um, table. It says percentage jet area. Less than 20% of LA area will be mild, while more than 40 will be severe. And if it's something in between, then you know you got to use other things as well. It's you know MR or any one of these valve lesions. It is so difficult. You know it's it's not as um, it, it's not easy. Therefore, you have like a whole list of seven or eight things we need to look at. We just cannot rely on one number. You cannot just rely on jet area to tell you whether it's mild, moderate, or severe. You got to use the vena contractor. You got to use a whole lot of other things as well. You all know what vena contractor is. I hope you remember. So you you're freeze frame freeze or frozen the uh, regurgitant jet and you're looking at that smallest width over there um, and that is the vena contracta very close to the origin of the mitral regurgitant jet you measure it in millimeters you can call it mild mr if it measures less than three and if it's severe it's more than seven next question is what is carpentier classification for valvar regurgitation. So does anyone remember what Carpentier classification was? So Carpentier, Dr. Carpentier designed this classification. It's not wild, wild, widely used by us cardiologists. I think it's underused. I think we should be using it a lot more. It helps us uh, take that extra step and figure out what is the reason for the regurgitation and not be just content with describing, yes, there is regurgitation, and second, yes, this is the severity of regurgitation. We get to introspect about the third important quality, which is why is there regurgitation. So here's the pictorial about it. This one says how it looks normally, the microvalve in systole and diastole. Type one, kind of mitral regurgitation is where the leaflets, the mitral valve is normal, but the annulus is dilated or there's something like a perforation over there. Type two, so for, so for example, if you have a VSC and your, your left heart is big, the annulus is dilated, so there's mitral regurgitation, very commonly observed phenomenon. We never tell the surgeon to do anything about it because we know it is remodeled and come back to normal, but that would be a type one under Carpentier. Type two would be leaflet prolapse. So excessive movement is type two, while type three is restricted movement. It's type three A if there's valvular or subvalvular thickening, and if the papillary muscles are moved apart, it's 3B. So this you can apply to mitral and tricuspid valves. Here's another question. Identify the anatomy of the mitral valve here. This is a attempt at a um, short axis, parasonal short axis view of the mitral valve. Please focus on it. Do you see the mitral valve on far and does it look normal? That's the question for you. So normally when we look at the parasonal short axis view of the mitral valve, you should be seeing one clean opening, obviously round opening, and uh, you should not be seeing two. You see two over here. You see one here and another one here. This is a double orifice mitral valve. I wouldn't say we see it commonly, but we, we do see it in either in association with other heart defects, for example, maybe in a TGA, or this along with other pathologies of the mitral valve itself. Here's a freeze frame that uh, brings us to question five. What is the color Doppler indicating here? It's showing you the left atrium, the left ventricle, and the color of it. What I want everybody to pay attention to is that look at the area of the left atrium. It looks big, so that's one thing that tells you something is um, wrong. Now, somebody said double orifice for the last one, which is correct. I just got to see it now. I'm sorry. Dr. Amit. 
So uh, this this particular question five, we're looking at an enlarged left atrium, and we see uh, inflow uh, color Doppler, and we see some turbulence, and this turbulence is originating right here. Not quite at the hinge point, but very much, you know, at the leaflet level, somewhere there, not down below, at the tips of the leaflet or the sub leaflet apparatus. If you see something like this, then realize and look out for a supramitral membrane. Does anyone know the difference between a supramitral membrane versus a, a ring? So somebody says ring. So there's a there's a difference between a core triatrium and a supramitral membrane. Does anyone know what that is? People need to read up and find out. Here's question six. Describe the pathology. So again, a four chamber view, you see the atrial septum going into the right atrium. You see that the left atrium is very much enlarged compared to the right atrium. Remember that both are supposed to be of roughly the equal size in a normal person. And you see the LV it appears to be contracting pretty all right. Actually, um, it's a little unclear question because you look at the whole study and you realize that Mm, this is not just an echo artifact, the mitral leaflets are actually thickened. Well, you can compare it head on with the tricuspid. So you see how this is thickened versus the tricuspid, which is nice and thin. Another thing you need to know is that the posterior leaflet, in this particular view, actually, this was the posterior leaflet, is not moving as well. So this, this clip is from a patient with a rheumatic affliction of the mitral valve. Question seven. We talked about a bit about DPDT. So how does DPDT of the LV help you in a case of mitral regurgitation? Does anyone remember? This particular clip shows us calculating out the DPDT. Two points, one taken at one meter per second, another taken at when the velocity is at three meters per second. And the, the number tells us the change in pressure from here to here, how much the pressure changes. So how do you think it's going to help us assess the degree of mitral regurgitation? Or tell us something useful about the mitral regurgitation. I noticed that somebody got the answers to the previous question correct about restricted motion. That's good, and thickened cordy. So this particular question, we need an answer for what DPDT is for the MR. So we're talking about pressure change in, in a quantum of time, and it reflects the systolic function, and the normal value is around 1,200 mmHg per second for the left ventricle. For the right ventricle, it's around 500, 600. And uh, somebody says good LV function. Well, um, need to elaborate a little bit more. What is important is that in case of mitral regurgitation, the LV gets to eject out into the low pressure left atrium and not just out into the aortic, uh, into the aorta, which has greater resistance. So it, um, it gets pretty easily and your ejection fraction ten tends to be supranormal. So EF will be higher than 65 and your DPDT will be around 1600, 1800 or so. So this is what you want to see. What you don't want to see is when things deteriorate, when the MR worsens, when your ejection fraction isn't as good anymore, and that's when your DPDT will start to normalize. It will show up as, you know, in the 1200 range, which is not a good thing. So it tells you in the face of MR when your ejection fraction and ventricular function should be supranormal, it is not. So it's a sign that you need to refer the patient to the surgeon, even though clinically the patient may be all right, inside things are worsening. So remember in mitral regurgitation, you need to have supranormal indices of 
ventricular function. Okay, this is a little um, tough one perhaps. I had sort of given you homework. We had looked at the spectral Doppler tracing of valve stenosis. And this particular one shows us interrogating the aortic valve from the suprasternal notch. It gives us a maximum and a mean gradient, you know, 50 and, uh, sorry, 59 and 29 mean. So my question is, what is the difference between peak instantaneous pressure gradient and peak to peak gradient? Has anyone read up or does anybody know? So this is the thing. In echo, when we get gradients, we get peak instantaneous gradients at a particular time. Let's say this point in systole. So peak to peak is measured in echo. Somebody says, Dr. Amitose, it shows Amitose thing. So peak to peak is measured in echo, he says. So which is not correct. We measure peak to peak in cat and peak instantaneous in echo. So let's let's go back to this. We're looking at this particular time in systole, and at that particular time, you're showing a gradient between the left ventricle and the aorta. So the LV has a particular pressure. Aorta at that time may not have the you know may have some x let's say x number of pressure, and it's going to tell you the difference between them. Versus in the cat lab, what we do is we look at the peak pressure in the LV, get the catheter up into the aorta, and then look at the peak pressure in the aorta. So that particular peak may not be at the same time when the peak is there in the LV, time-wise. Temporally, the two peaks may be different. The echo gives us the peak instantaneous pressure gradient, while peak to peak is obtained in cat. That's the difference. And that's one of the reasons we find that the mean gradient is uh, a better or closer to the to the peak to peak gradient that we get in GAT. So have a look at this. This is a parasternal long axis view. What do you think we see over here? One thing which catches our eye is obviously the LV dysfunction, that's correct. And now let's pay close attention to the valves because that's the focus of our talk here. Mitral valve is not very well profiled, not opening well. What about the aortic valve? Is everybody happy with it? So the clue is the aortic valve is bad. That area is bad, so what do you see over there? What we see over there on close inspection is that just in the subvalvar area, there is a membrane. The membrane extends from the septum side, and side as well as the mitral side. So that's a subaortic membrane associated with poor function. All right, so now let's move on to our patients. We've seen all of these. We want to move on to where we stopped last time. Covered the subiotic membrane. <clears throat> we had also covered the supravalvar aortic stenosis. So if you remember, we talked about Williams syndrome. So it's after that that we had stopped. Okay, so we'll move onward and forward and cover this time aortic regurgitation in the VSD setting. Also in the non-VSD setting, move on to pulmonary valve, pure valve stenosis and then a case of tetralogy and end with assessing pulmonary regurgitation and tricuspid regurgitation. So we'll go through some echo clips and we will discuss as we go along. 
So here's a parasternal short axis view. You find that the LV is filling up your uh, sector. You hardly see any RV. That's a sign that the left ventricle is enlarged. The contractility appears normal. Here is an M mode telling us the end diastolic volume of 200 and systolic volume of 92. Um, remember last time we had mentioned for valve regurgitation, it's important to assess the end systolic number as well which is a little independent of the um, ejection fraction. And uh, the, it's always indexed. So let's say this is a 12-year-old girl with this kind of number and her PSA is one meter square. So your end systolic volume, absolute number is 92, corrected will also be 92. And that's way above our cutoff of 55, which is an indication for surgical referral. Uh, for addressing the valve regurgitation. Now, if the valve, if, if her DSA is 1.5, then obviously your ESV will come down, your corrected ESV. And a very, that's a very important number that you have to pay attention to and report every single time. Here's a parasternal long axis view. One thing we should catch your eye in 2D as well is that you see the aortic crust here that has no business of going on the other side of the ventricular septum. So there's something wrong over there. Here is the personal uh, short axis view, the three cusps. Maybe a little bit thickening here, otherwise not much noticeable. Not too happy with the movement of this non-coronary cusp. Here is an apical four-chamber view. Atrial septum is bulging into the right atrium. Left atrium is enlarged compared to the right atrium. LV is dilated. Mitral valve looks all right. Concentrating on the LVOT and the aortic valve. Cusps don't look normal. I don't like the restricted way in which this particular cusp is moving. Also, why is that cusp going on that side of the ventricular septum? The sector is narrowed. This increases the resolution a whole lot. Here's a color flow, and that shows that there's actually a VSD here. And it turns out that this patient had the right coronary cusp going into that VSD and restricting it. So, Effectively small VSG, pressure restricted, but when the surgeon, so surgeon opens up the right atrium and peers in through the tricuspid valve, uncovers the RCC, he'll find a large defect there. So one other thing that should catch your eye, obviously, is the amount of aortic regurgitation, the red signal there. Look at how broad it is, very broad. It's filling up the entire LVOT. So your aortic regurgitation assessment parameters, one of which is look at the area of the regurgitant jet with respect to the area of the LVOT. So here it's almost approaching one, severe regurgitation. Okay. Um, so, parasternal short axis view showing us a problem, a broadish jet at the uh, coaptation line of the right with the left cusp. Okay. Here's the suprasternal view, and it shows a lot of regurgitation. Now, we can actually go ahead and quantify it. Here we have done a velocity time integral tracing of the forward flow, which would be this obviously the blue going below the baseline, giving us um, 18.2 as the VTI. And then this signal here, which is the reversal and which is holodiastolic, pans entire diastole and gives us a VTI of 20. So you actually reverse flow is more than what is going over here forward flow. Yes, there will be a little variation if you get this measurement three times or if you take it a little bit higher or lower than where we have placed our gate. 
but you know you will get a very good idea of the degree of regurgitation the ratio is expressed as reverse upon forward and something like 0.3 is mild and 0.7 or more would be severe so this one is one so you know comes in severe regurgitation again a reminder you cannot rely on just one number and say because of this i'm going to report it as regurgitation go to look at all the other factors and then report it as whatever you want to report it as move on to another patient now starting again with a parasternal short axis view you see a little bit of the rv there and we does look dilated mitral valve looks thickened here we go again we've got our m mode gives us the end systolic volume 113 we're going to index it this time and see whether it's above or below or cut off of 55 ml index psp this is a free stream of the aortic cusp and if you like what better picture i'll just take you forward okay so here we look at the mitral valve actually this is thickened posterior leaflet not moving well regurgitation see echo is a very operator dependent test unlike the ct or mri and the reason i'm saying this said is that no matter who gets the ct or mri if you follow some basic um principles or protocol you will get some information and that then the radiologist can look at the entire data and give you a report and even you can look at it and you know get the same report for echo when we share it with you know our colleagues or you know the surgeons the end users then what we have to share is what we store and therefore it makes sense to store the maximum or in in a case of valvular regurgitation for example mitral regurgitation you can't just obtain a parasternal long axis view the you know the textbook parasternal long axis you look at the amount of mr in that and say okay so this is what the degree of mr is based on this picture no you have to twist your and turn your probe and get the maximum amount, amount of mr and store it and share that with the surgeon so if you don't store it or if you don't you know you scanning and you're not sharing that view then the the test result will be wrong very very vital that we examine the heart very properly let's focus a bit on the aortic regurgitation so you see a jet hitting upwards going upwards Four chamber view, some dilatation of the left atrium. LV is dilated for sure. Mitral valve leaflets are thickened. So that's the regurgitation jet for you. And look at the amount of AR here as well. so one other factor we consider is the length of the aortic regurgitation jet so if it's just very close to the valve it's trivial and if it's just in the lvot it's mild if it extends till only half way into the lv it's moderate if it goes all the way down then it's severe so lots and lots of parameters and here you see it hitting all the way down an important aspect of a report involving aortic valve pathology are dimensions because we might be wanting to replace the valve or do a ros so a lot depends on accurate measurements so go ahead and obtain the aortic annulus in systole hinge point to hinge point get the intersinus distance get the sinotubular junction everything in systole and also get the ascending aortic diameter in systole and report it as such in um these days of standardization uh, we've got protocol set up on how to report left ventricular function and the most recent guideline says that you cannot just report the 
ejection fraction based on the M mode, you need to do a Simpson, you need to do a biplane Simpson, which means you take a four chamber view and trace out your end diastolic and systolic area uh, areas and get a four chamber ejection fraction, then go ahead and get your two chamber view by going 90 degree to your probe position, your routine probe position, and again get the end diastolic systolic numbers and get a Simpson biplane ejection fraction. So at least in the cases where it matters, for example, where you're doing serial follow-up of your patient with a significant amount of valve regurgitation, or let's say DCM patients, where EF is a very vital number, go ahead and get in the habit of obtaining biplane symptoms. An essential part of uh, valve regurgitation is to get into details of function evaluation. So EF is just telling you systolic function, right? It's just one index, how the ventricle is contracting. When you look at obtaining velocities of the tissue, for example, here, the the base of the mitral valve leaflet, uh, the lateral aspect, then you get such tracing. This is tissue Doppler imaging. So we can start off by looking at the velocity of this wave, which is the S wave. The peak velocity here, this is the H point, is 8 centimeter per second. It's pretty all right. And that reflects systolic function. Diastole is represented by the E prime and the A prime. And uh, the most important number that, you know, we look at for diastolic function evaluation is the ratio of the E, which we obtain by pulse Doppler of the mitral valve inflow, and the E prime, which we get by tissue Doppler of either the lateral or the mitral um, annulus. So E by E, here is 11, so it's mildly deranged. Around six, seven, eight or so is normal. And you know, you can check out your DCM patients and you'll get severely elevated E by E primes, more like uh, 14, 16, etc. Here is a spectral Doppler of the aortic regurgitation signal. So a very dense signal obviously means greater regurgitation. Here again, we're comparing the reverse flow and forward flow, flow VTI, velocity time integrals. Okay, now let's switch gears to pulmonary stenosis. Here's a patient, an infant, parasternal short axis view of the base of the heart. And you see here how the pulmonary valve cusps are doming. They're not opening up completely. The infundibular area looks pretty all right. That's another view of the valve cusps doming. This patient had an ASD shunting right to left because of that degree of pulmonary stenosis. Can anyone tell me if the ASD has any importance, any important role to play when we carry out ballooning of the pulmonary valve? So role of an ASD in BPV. Any answers there? The interventionalist is happy to see an ASD because it means that when the balloon blocks the pulmonary valve during inflation and blocks forward flow, your cardiac output will still be maintained because although you won't have for those 10 seconds blood coming in from the pulmonary veins, you have blood flowing across the ASD, you will get desaturated blood, but your forward flow across the aortic valve will be maintained. So it's nice to see an ASD. If in presence of pulmonary stenosis, you have an ASD shunting right to left, obviously it means, you know, you've got to respect the amount of stenosis, no matter whatever gradient you get. Okay, so here, this is actually the thymus, and we're seeing the on fast view of the pulmonary valve. The cusps appear thickened. That's the color flow, showing that the Doppler signal, the turbulence aliasing starts at the cusps level. There's nothing at the annular level, nothing in the sub, 
valvar level. Remember to interrogate your valves at not above 90 for the aortic and pulmonary and certainly around 60 to 70 centimeter per second for the mitral and tricuspid valves. I'm talking about the scale limits. Do not let them go up to 100, 120, 130, etc. Here's another look, a um, little atypical view, pulmonary valve seen, cusps are doming, a lot of turbulence seen starting at the cusps level, some pulmonary, uh, main pulmonary artery dilatation is also very evident. In a case of pure pulmonary valvular stenosis, this is always a sign that the MPA is dilated. In supravalvular stenosis, you will not get MPA dilatation. Another look at the same, and here is a spectral Doppler. You get some 92 gradient, a lot of gradient there. All right, so that was purely valvular stenosis. Now let's move on to tetralogy of shallow, which is a combination of different levels of stenosis. You see the aortic override in this parasternal long axis view. You see the VST, dilated aortic annulus. We switch on to personal short axis view, aortic valve, VSG. What is this called? Can anyone tell me what is the name of this portion of the septum? So people have said uh, correctly, it's the conus. So we are talking about the pedetal appearance of the right ventricle. You have a spout. And that spout opens up into the pulmonary valve and the length of the spout is the infundibulum. And that septum which separates it from the aortic valve is the conal septum, infundibular septum. And so nicely you see this over here that the conal septum is anteriorly deviated, causing the aortic override and causing that conus to obstruct the subpulmonary valvar area. And how nicely we also see that the narrowest area seems to be the os infundibulum, which is the beginning point of the infundibular region. Look at how the infundibulum itself appears. It appears pretty roomy. So it will be nice when you, the next time you make a report on tetralogy of fallow, that you get into describing all of this whether you thought that the infundibulum was long or short, whether you thought the primary problem was at the os or whether it was, if the whole thing was narrow. So we measure out the pulmonary valve, try and take multiple measurements and use your judgment to figure out which would be the closest to the truth. Obviously, from hinge point to hinge point in systole, and it will be nice if you have an ECG tracing, ECG gated study. You see the cusps over here doming. Parasternal, uh, sorry, uh, four chamber view, four chamber view of the heart. A little atypical, but the right ventricle is actually hypertrophied, which is fine, but also dilated. It's apex forming. Right atrium is enlarged a little bit in this particular case. Subcostal view gives us beautiful images of the infundibulum. This is the aorta, the VST, the conal septum. That's the awesome infundibulum showing the narrowing, the pulmonary valve, MPA, and then the bifurcation. Remember that we can very well measure the branch PAs over here. We can freeze and then measure up the RPA and LPA here, but then it's not appropriate to compare your diameters that you obtain here and obtain these scores from them because these scores, the way they were obtained, are very standardized. For the RPA, you need to go to your suprasternal short axis view and measure it insistently just before the RPA gets off the first branch. For the LPA, you can obtain it from the parasternal short axis view where you see a good length of it or in your suprasternal long axis where you see it following the course of the descending aorta. So that's what I suggest you should do. Stick to standardized protocols. 
So right ventricle showing the aorta and also the infundibular area. Now the the training, especially in initial part of the training, it's pretty confusing because in essentially any patient with a VHD, you can create a view from a subcostal area where it appears that the aorta also rises from the right ventricle, and you can you know overcall um, aortic regurgitation. So remember that aortic regur uh, not regurgitation, sorry, aortic override. Everything appears to be originating from the right ventricle. Remember to call something an aortic override only in your very, very standardized parasternal long axis view where you have the ventricular septum laid out horizontally across your sector. There, if you see override, then that's what true override is. So in contrast to the previous patient where we saw that the turbulence originated at the level of the doming cusp, here you've got turbulence originating at the osin fundibulum. This is a very, very typical spectral Doppler tracing of a tetralogy of fallow where you have this dagger shaped thing reflecting the infundibular component which slowly rises over time versus the valvar component which immediately at the onset of system you see a high peak, you know, high, you know, change, increase in velocity and then peaks. The subvalvar peaks later, the valvar peaks sooner. Very typical. Color compare view. Remember that color compare view is great. You see the 2D and you see the color at the same time, um, but it's not as good as seeing the 2D alone followed by color later because in this view, the 2D resolution is compromised. So don't perform entire studies in color compare mode. Very nicely, you see how the os in fundibulum shows the maximum stenosis, and then there's little room, roominess, you know, little, the, the signal gets better, less turbulent, and then once again, there's turbulence at the valvar level. See the bifurcation, it's useful to comment whether the branch PAs are like, almost like a T, where the angle between them is very, very wide, versus like a Y. All that has an uh, implication on how the surgeon will plan out his repair. <coughs> Excuse me. Moving on to our next patient, a very important aspect of repair tetralogies is to assess the degree of pulmonary regurgitation. As we are all very well aware, if the surgeon has to put in a transannular patch, the function of the pulmonary valve is destroyed, and this has a consequence of producing significant pulmonary regurgitation, causing volume overload of the right ventricle, which over time may produce, will produce right ventricular enlargement and dysfunction. So parasternal short axis view, you look at the size of this RV and compared to the LV, this is very dilated. So you, you can standardize it and measure out your RVIDD here. Um, it has been our observation that in Indian patients, if we use the Z-scores obtained from those in the West as on the website parameters.com, the RVIDD that we get always, even though it's um, well, not always, most of the time, even though it, is, it looks big, we put it in and our Z-scores say it's normal. So we have learned uh, to ignore the RVI disease scores. We religiously obtain them in every patient of post-op tetralogy, and we serially compare numbers. So today it is uh, two centimeters, and six months later it's three centimeters means there's a problem. Two months later it's 2.3, I wouldn't really care, because what I have in mind is number one, growth of the patient, and number two, obviously, error of measurement. So be practical, and at the same time realize the importance of serial follow-up. Hopefully, with your kind of counseling, the patient will not disappear on you, will realize the importance of follow-up, and you will be able to see how things are even five years down the line. So parasternal short axis view telling you that, look, look at how the RVOT is, it's, it's dilated. You could measure out, uh, you know, freeze and measure out even here, report an RVOT dimension proximal to the valve. Here we measured it out as 2.75 centimeters. 
So uh, apical four chamber view showing that the right atrium is enlarged. The RV looks dilated. I put color flow across the pulmonary valve and the pulmonary regurgitation is not well seen across the valve here, but I wanted to highlight the branch pulmonary artery. See how there's blue and red. This is flow reversal seen in the branch pulmonary arteries as well. This is a sign that the regurgitation is severe. The other signs are, for example, the density of the sig signal on spectral Doppler or the uh, the width of the PR jet with respect to the RVOT di diameter. Uh, one very important thing, though, is this, that if you see flow reversal in the branch pulmonary arteries, it's going to be severe regurgitation. So there you go, a lot of flow reversal. Flow reversal LP as well. Okay, now what you want to do is assess, yes, the regurgitation, assess the size of the right ventricle and also report the function because ultimately the valve regurgitation is going to impact the right ventricular function. We're not used to assessing function of the RV, but we should be, especially for systemic right ventricles or post op tetralogies. One thing we use consistently is the, change, the fractional area of change. We get a nice uh, view of the right ventricle in four chamber apical view, trace the diastolic area, the systolic area, and then see the difference divided by the diastolic dimension. So that will give, give us a fractional area of contraction. And uh, 44 is a pretty normal number. TAPSI, tricuspid annual plane systolic excursion, another uh, parameter of systolic function of the right ventricle. Z scores are also available. Put then M mode cursor across the um, tricuspid annulus and see how one particular point moves systole versus diastole. That reflects the longitudinal function of the right ventricle. Assess, obviously, the pressure of the RV. And do not forget to pulse Doppler the pulmonary valve. This is a pulse Doppler of the pulmonary valve. What you see is the blue, which is, of course, the forward flow. Now, between the two forward flow signals is the, uh, flow, is the flow reversal, which is the pulmonary regurgitant jet. You could quantify the time that the PR pulmonary regurgitation jet occupies with respect to the length of the entire diastole. The longer the signal, the more is your regurgitation. So, 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 um, all right. So the PR, so this is how you calculate out the PR index. I do want to draw your attention to something called Andrew Reddington wave or the A wave. This is something that you will see when you pulse Doppler the pulmonary valve. You will see that the PR jet ends, does not extend for the entire diastole. Instead, at the end diastole, just before your systole begins, you see forward flow, which is seen as something below the baseline. So that, right over here, that would be an Andrew Reddington wave. And what that is telling you is that the PR is restricted by forward flow. When end diastole is when the atrium contracts. So end diastole is the time when there's atrial systole. When the atrium contracts into the right ventricle, the right ventricle in this particular case is so stiff, non-compliant, that the blood moves from across the tricuspid valve and directly across the pulmonary valve, which is open because there is no valve, there is free regurgitation. I mean, it, it, it doesn't close. So that blood directly moves out across, even in diastole, end diastole. That shows us that there is restrictive physiology. Patients who have a transannular patch, severe pulmonary regurgitation, and show an A wave are likely to have less amount of right ventricular volume overloading because 
the amount of PR will be restricted. So important to note whether it is, whether it is there or not. This restrictive physiology seen as this Andrew Reddington uh, A wave in end diastole does not help in immediate post-operative course, but it helps long term. So for those chronic follow-ups, if you see this, you can probably be a little happy. Okay, I think we are close to being done. I'll end with a case of tricuspid valve regurgitation. Okay. All right, so here is a view, a short axis view, parasternal, showing tricuspid valve septal leaflet appears very, very thick. There appears to be something on it. And look at this, heavily loaded with actually germs, a huge vegetation plopping in and out like that of the right atrium. Another view of the same. A lot of regurgitation, a white jet filling up the right atrium, some amount of seeding, seeding even on the atrial septum. So RV inflow view, parasternal long axis, showing how that blob of vegetation is plopping. Just an interesting case I thought I'd share with you all. So this patient ended up going to the operation theater and the valve was so badly involved that the entire septal leaflet had to be cut and they had to, surgeon had to refashion a um, new leaflet. His immediate post-operative echo showed a very significant amount of tricuspid regurgitation, which over the course of next six months, now he's more than six months post, has slowly regressed. So that is seen as less of that regurgitant signal has been seen also as a regression in the size of the right atrium. So that's it for today. Thank you, folks. If there are any quick questions, I can take them.